Let's see, the one, the first question, why I ran out on introducing a certain individual. And my answer is, I didn't run out. I just didn't come over to do it. <laughs> so that answers that. <laughs> no, actually, I will admit, I forgot. What? <laughs> so... <laughs> the first question we really want to deal with is the idea of praying to Jesus. Is it right? And then also in connection with that, singing songs that are prayers or that advocate praying to Jesus. Jesus gave us an illustration of prayer in Matthew, the sixth chapter. The world calls it the Lord's Prayer, which is far from the truth. It's not. Uh, might call it the Disciples' Prayer, uh, in that it was an example for them to use to pray. And the first thing that I would say about that in relationship to what it says, actually, it is that it does not say, pray after these words, or pray these words. It is an example for prayer. But in that example for prayer, it starts off as to who we direct our prayers to. And that is to the Father. Thus, why would we want to change that example that our Lord gave us to use? Uh, but then, if you would, turn over to John, the 16th chapter. And I believe... This really answers the question as well as anything. Because in saying that about the model prayer, some would say, well, that doesn't mean that it excludes praying to Jesus or praying to the Holy Spirit. Or I guess you could get praying to Mary or praying to an apostle or a departed saint or anyone else. Uh, that they wanted to get included. But when we turn to John, the 16th chapter, we do have something along that line. In verses 23 and 24, Jesus says specifically, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. The first question that needs to be dealt with is the phrase, In that day. What day is that talking about? Is it talking about the days of the Mosaic Age? Is it talking about the days that Jesus was there at that time and thus that preparation for the New Testament age? If you go back a little ways in the chapter and really uh, you could start at the first of the chapter but in verse 6 he tells them, but because I said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So here, Jesus then begins discussing the aspect of the Holy Spirit coming to the apostles and some misuse this to try to teach that Holy Spirit comes to us today and that we have these things. No, we don't. This isn't talking to us. Jesus was talking to his apostles. 
And thus, when you get down to verse 12 and verse 13, I have many things to say unto you, you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Some people think that they're guided into all truth today. No, they're not. That they take this and apply it to themselves. No. This is speaking to the apostles. But, uh, guide you into all truth. Uh, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Thus, Jesus is dealing with the aspect of when he's going to send, or the Spirit is going to come to the apostles and guiding them into all truth. Well, when is that? Well, we could go over to Acts, second chapter, of course, and we would see that the Holy Spirit comes to the apostles. And that's not to the 120 of chapter 1 and verse 15, but it was to the apostles. And they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak with tongues or languages of man. What was that? That was a fulfilling of what Jesus is speaking here. Thus, when we come back over to verse 23... And we could go ahead and continue a little bit more in this and emphasize the same aspect. Well, we get over verse 23. In that day, what day? It's going to be the day of the New Testament period of time. That day in which the apostles are speaking forth that all truth and being guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit. In that day. Ye shall ask me nothing. Now, why would someone come along and say, well, we can anyway? Even though Jesus says, ask me nothing. And by the way, the word ask there is often translated as pray. In fact, it is in this context even, both in the 14th chapter and in the 16th chapter. And, of course, chapters 14, 15, and 16 all are dealing with the same context of the apostle, Jesus speaking to the apostles. And he uses this exact word for prayer. And so it would be proper to even come down here and say, in that day ye shall pray, or not pray, or ye shall pray to the Father, and he will give it unto you. You are not to ask me or you're not to pray to me. And yet we have brethren who are coming along and teaching that we can somehow pray to Jesus. Well, Jesus solves the situation when he says, Ye shall ask me nothing. And again, that word ask is a word that's translated pray. One other passage, though, and it would emphasize much the same thing, would be in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And verse 20, and then I'll maybe make a couple of other comments and then open the floor for other comments and questions. But here in Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is doing exactly the thing that Jesus stated in John the 12th chapter, or actually 16th chapter. Praying to the Father, and the idea of giving thanks would be the, in relationship to prayer. So praying to the Father, or God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, why then do those individuals advocate that we can pray to Jesus? Because of some special situations that took place during the New Testament time. First, time, oh, first one, I guess, we use is in relationship to the selection of an apostle. In Acts, the first chapter, and they basically asked Jesus, which one of these two is to be an apostle. 
and the lot was fell upon Matthias. And so, here's an example of praying to Jesus. Uh, first thing I would notice is that that has was taking place prior to coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts, the second chapter. But second, it's a special situation. You cannot take a special situation and make it applicable to everyone. Just an improper way of applying the scriptures. The third thing is, this was not only in relationship to a special situation, this was a selection of an apostle of Jesus Christ. And thus, who is the one that's going to be asked who is to be an apostle of Jesus Christ other than Jesus? He is the one who is selecting the apostles, not other individuals. And thus, it would be natural asking him in relationship to that. But again, it's a special situation that's not applicable for us today. Another illustration would be Stephen in Acts, the seventh chapter. As he is being stoned, he looks up and he sees Jesus and he, some say, prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I'm not sure who the first one who stated this. I think uh, maybe the first one that I heard was Roy Deaver making the comment that if you're ever being stoned and you look up and you see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, that you can pray to Jesus also. Uh, in saying that, he was basically saying it's a special situation that is not applicable to anyone today. And that is the case. Some would even argue whether or not really that is even a prayer. I not even going to get into that aspect because it, even if it is, it's still a special situation that does not apply to you and me today. And so I try and take these type of illustrations likened to that and apply them to today. And you can't do that. It's an improper way of study. And you have Jesus' specific statement that in that day, talking about the New Testament age, Ye shall ask me nothing. Uh, the other aspect that we could discuss would be that there's simply no authority for it. And that's what thus it gets down to. You have no authority for it. You have a specific statement of Jesus, don't do it. And you have the illustrations of praying to the Father in the name of Christ. In relationship to songs that are prayer songs to Jesus, well, if it's wrong to pray to Jesus, it's wrong to do it in the song as well. And there would be songs in which advocate praying to Jesus. That would be just as wrong. Uh, and I realize that when sometimes you deal with songs, you get some people all upset because, well, they're in our songbook. Well, that doesn't mean they're right. Um, and it doesn't. You still have to look at the words. In relationship to songs, though, let me give this warning. They are... Poetry, in a sense, there's an aspect of poetic license that we allow. Uh, second thing is that if a statement, and these are being statements that are made by humans, if it can be understood in more than one way, one of them scriptural, maybe one unscriptural, why not accept it or sing it in the relationship to the scriptural way? And be done with it. Uh, third, there are some what, the songs in which you can change the words. Um, I think some brethren get all upset if you go, well, we need to change the wording of this song. <gasps> How dare you change the word? It's almost uh, worse to change the words of a song than it is the scripture. Hopefully not, but uh, you understand the point. 
uh, change the word to where it is scriptural. All of those are certainly available to us. I'm sure there's a lot of others who want to add to the quick comments that I've made, so make sure you come up to the mic and state your name, where you're from, and all that good stuff. Gary? Gary Summers, Winter Park, Florida. Um, I have a couple of articles on uh, spiritualperspectives.org that deal with this in response to Wayne Jackson, who has uh, been promoting this idea. Uh, most of his material is real good, uh, but I just, uh, I just can't uh, abide his position on this. Uh, I agree with uh, what Michael said. Uh, the only thing I would say is, and you may be right, you made a good case for it, but it doesn't say Lord Jesus in Acts 1. It just says Lord, which could be the Father, or it could be Jesus. Um, one thing that, that I wondered is, why would anyone insist on doing this? We know that we're all safe preaching or praying to our Father. So why would we impose uh, addressing Jesus uh, when we're all comfortable with the way that uh, the Scripture uh, gives us as a model prayer, what Jesus himself gave us? So why would we do that? If somebody wants to pray to Jesus privately, uh, I still think they're wrong, but they're free to do that and not include the rest of us. And uh, so that would seem to be a, an approach is let's, let's not try to introduce this into congregations when it's unnecessary. About changing the word, I happened to notice when, right, one day when we were singing, uh, Sing and Be Happy, that in the chorus it says, look to him and pray, but the other part says, look to Jesus and pray. And uh, so we suggested to our congregation that we just say, look to God and pray. Mm -hmm. And just with that one change, everything is pretty good. Um, you are correct. In Acts 1, it just says, Lord. And yes, Lord could apply to the Father. It can apply to the Son. It can apply to others as well at times. But uh, it does not specify Jesus there. With Stephen, it does, Lord Jesus. Um, but I, I think in Acts 1, I would still think, in my view, Lord is being used in reference to Jesus there. I wouldn't argue one way or the other about it. David Brown, Spring, Texas. I think there's a, a tremendous need when it comes down to the matter of of songs, and I'll concentrate on the poetic license part of it, to realize that a great many of these songs are not written by members of the church. They don't have a proper concept of many times the kingdom, uh, the church, salvation by grace, uh, so many different ones. And uh, we are still obligated to whatever we do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is, by his authority. And thus, when we handle even these songs, or songs that are, are, have a rhyme scheme to them, thus poetry, we still have to have the undergirding idea, is this thing authorized? Because we are, we are teaching other people, if we're worshiping correctly in, in song. And yet, at the same time, we must teach people about songs. If you're not taught the truth of the Bible... There are a number of songs. I don't know what you think you're saying in those songs. Um, you've got to be taught correctly <clears throat> to be able to perceive the right thing in the song. Uh, amazing grace. Now, let me ask you this. When the Baptists sing that, and when we sing it, what's going to cause each one of us to have a different view of what that song is really saying? It's going to be whether you know the truth or not about uh, salvation by grace through an obedient faith. Well, they don't believe that. It's also sort of interesting to note that <clears throat> I haven't heard anybody, somebody probably has, I just haven't heard about it. Uh, we'll sing uh, on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise. And yet the scripture says when you see him coming with the clouds. Every eye shall see him. Well, they're saying two different things. 
We're talking about bright and cloudless morning from the standpoint of all worries, cares, and woes, sins, and death are all gone. And the scripture is simply saying he's coming with the clouds. And so, one, you have to allow for the figurative idea of a, of a beautiful morning when all the cares of the world are gone for those who die faithful in Christ. And then the actual statement of the scriptures that said when the Lord comes, he comes with the clouds even as you've seen him go. There has to be an understanding about how to handle uh, various songs. Now, if there's an absolute statement that just can't be put into any kind of poetic license or, or whatever, uh, then just set it aside and don't use it and point it out that it doesn't convey in the words of the thing the truth, but it conveys error. But what we're really saying is we need to study our songbooks. Yeah. We need to study our songbooks. And where you have maybe more figurative language, it needs to be brought out as to what really we're saying. Because people in the audience, they're going to understand that song and what they're saying on the basis of what they think the Bible says. You'll remember, I know, Brother Dub, that the great songs of the church that maybe 50 years ago were pretty much the song book that was around most congregations. It was basically what blew. That was usually the one. Before that, most churches used what it called Christian hymns, gospel advocate. And those, you didn't have to worry about a lot of stuff like that. Brother, uh, Brother L.O. Sanderson was editing them. You didn't have to worry about it. But do you know that the great songs of the church originally was put out by people trying to get the premillennial doctrine into the church, while the fellows behind that songbook were the ones that Fort Wallace fought in the 1930s on their view of the kingdom. And, and, and so, you, you know, do people know all about that? Do they understand why the fellow with that, that want to put those certain songs in there? And so, how does a premillennialist sing a song that talks about the kingdom? You know what he's thinking about the kingdom when he, when he sings it. So it all comes down to really education. Regarding praying, uh, you know, I think John uh, 14, 6 has a lot to do with this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, is that all inclusive? If it is, it covers prayer. And he's the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. I go through Christ to the Father. That's the whole point of Christ's coming is that he's the access to the Father. And to me, that, uh, that is simply Ephesians overlooked. Two, is it 18? Also along mm -hmm. that line. Uh, the idea then is, I go through Christ with every prayer. Now think about that. If he's going to mediate for me, and he says, and uh, the writer of Hebrews says, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So every prayer I offer directly to the Father, according to the model prayer, and as some of the comments you've made regarding that, uh, who is mediating for me and who is making intercession for me? It's, it's the Christ. I'm going by His agency before the Father. If he, wa if he had not done what He did, there would be no access to the Father, prayer any other way. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. Thank you. Um point that I was making, Gary mentioned the song Sing and Be Happy. And I just use that as an illustration because I changed that wording also to look to God and pray. Um, I do that. Uh, but is there a way in which we can and do look to Jesus and pray? Yes, we do. We look to him as our mediator to go to the Father in prayer. Now, can it be understood in that song in that way? Yes, it can be. Can it be understood that the song is saying, look to Jesus and praying to Jesus? Well, yes, it could be considered that way as well. Now, that's what I meant. There's some, the wording can be understood in more than one way on some songs. Why not understand it in the scriptural way? Even though, as I said, I've, not Gary, I change it to look to God and pray. Uh, but a lot of times in what David was saying, education, need to teach brethren. And that means continually reminding them about some of these songs uh, and making them scriptural. Uh, he was saying in relationship to Amazing Grace, how many songs talk about 
uh, when we believe about being saved. Well, is it true? Yes, in one sense. Not the way that denominational world thinks about it. But when you understand faith is embrace of all of the acts of obedience to God, then yes. Uh, so that's why, again, an understanding of what is, what is being said and what is actually in God's Word. A lot of times our brethren don't know. Uh, anyone else want to add some comments? Okay. How long do we have? We got about fifteen minutes. Okay. Another question regards First Corinthians seven verse thirty nine, which states the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. And that phrase, only in the Lord. Uh, does it mean that a widow can marry only a Christian? Uh, and the phrase, only in the Lord here, <clears throat> is very basically an adverbial phrase. It refers back to an adverb or to a verb reason it's an adverb goes back to a verb. The verb in this case is marry. It is describing thus the aspect of marriage and not the person. If it meant only a Christian, it would have to be an adjectival phrase referring back to a noun or pronoun. Basically, there is none to be found in relationship to this verse, as far as it referring back to something, an ad, or a noun, or a pronoun. Thus, it does not have reference to the individual being a Christian, but it has reference to according to the principles that God has set forth within his work and that a person it must marry according to those principles. Uh, that the person that they would marry must be someone who is eligible for a marriage. Uh, and those three categories, we would understand someone who has never been married, someone who has lost their mate by death, or someone who has put away their mate because their mate committed fornication. That's three classes of individuals who have the right to get married. And thus, upon that, those principles, we have the widow can marry. It would be much like Ephesians 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Does it mean a Christian there? So children, obey your parents if they are Christians. What if their parents are not Christians? Does that mean they no longer have to obey their parents? Well, of course not. We understand it in that phrase in Ephesians 6, 1. Why not in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 7 39? I ran across, though, just recently another argument dealing with this because we generally when we deal with this subject I don't know of anyone who's a, a faithful preacher who does not warn from the standpoint it is not wise for a Christian to marry a non-Christian it is something that is very unwise So, this one was new to me. Maybe all of the familiar with this argument, but had one individual claim that thus, it is sinful for a Christian to marry a non-Christian. Well, why? 
And the question was repeatedly asked, what do you do if a Christian does marry a non-Christian? How do you repent of that? And they didn't really answer that question. But they argued based upon Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And thus, since we all admit that it is unwise for a Christian to marry a non-Christian, it is thus sin for a Christian to marry a non-Christian. Now, Terry can, in a few minutes, put that in a logical syllogism for us. And uh, one of the two things that I pointed out was that if you're saying that anything that you do that is unwise is sin, then you would have some things are unwise for some individuals and wise for some others. And so you have an action itself that is both sin and not sin. Now that's a problem, isn't it? A second problem with that is that there's a lot of times that you do something that later on you learn was an unwise action. But you did not know that until after you did it. Therefore, you don't even know what sin is until after the fact, at least in some areas. So that would be two problems with that viewpoint. But generally, it is, um, there are a lot of individuals who believe that this has reference to someone who is a widow must wear, marry a Christian. The phraseology that's here is simply, that's not the case. It is they must marry according to the principles of Christianity, of Christ. And yes, it's still unwise for a Christian to marry a non-Christian. Let me go farther than that, though. It is unwise for a faithful, dedicated Christian to marry someone who might be a so-called Christian but really isn't that dedicated to God. I think we sometimes talk, Christian needs to marry a Christian. Well, a faithful Christian needs to be married to a faithful Christian. Because just like a Christian who marries a non-Christian in most cases that Christian is going to be drugged down by that non-Christian to apostatize. The faithful, dedicated Christian who marries someone who's not is going to be generally pulled down and they become very weak need Christian. Other comments or questions in relationship to that? Disagreements. <laughs> Notice that when I said disagreements, that's when he got up. <laughs> Doug McLeish did in Texas. No, I don't disagree. <laughs> um, I thought folks might find it interesting that uh, among the brethren in Singapore, as some of us have gone over there back through the years, uh, we found that this is a perpetual problem there. Uh, we were, uh, almost every time we went, uh, queried very carefully by the Chinese brethren because they, uh, they really were strong in saying that a Christian simply could not marry a non-Christian without uh, sinning. And they like to go to Second Corinthians chapter 6, uh, be not unequally yoked, and apply that passage to it, which could have some implications, but I do not believe Paul's talking about marriage there. Uh, we should not be in any relationship that uh, will cause us to lose our souls, and I think that's 
why Paul wrote what he did about marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, about a wife not having to remain with a husband who was going to keep her from going to heaven, did not mean she had the right to remarry just because of that, but that uh, she did not have to remain in a relationship. And, of course, a husband would not have to remain in a relationship where a uh, spouse would cause their souls to be lost. But um, in reasoning, trying to reason with the Chinese brethren on this in Singapore, we would always go to 1 Corinthians 7 and ask, uh, why did not Paul uh, proscribe those marriages that had already occurred where a believer and a non-believer were married to each other? Rather, he gave his inspired approval to those unions and said that you need not be concerned about them except for what he later said, don't stay with one that will cause you to be lost. Your children even are sanctified in such a marriage. Your children are not illegitimate just because you have a non-Christian husband or a non-Christian wife. Now, <clears throat> the matter of wisdom, uh, as Michael has said, I'll simply repeat, uh, I don't have no faithful gospel preacher who would ever encourage a Christian to marry a non-Christian. Uh, all of us know of uh, cases where if a Christian had not married a non-Christian, that uh, non-Christian would not be a gospel preacher or an elder in the church in future years, but those are the exceptions. We ought not to marry someone just for that cause. As we've probably all known of situations where a, a uh, young lady was... Uh, madly in love with a young man and the young man said oh yes I'll become a Christian I'll be faithful I'll, I'll go to worship with you and so forth and that lasted as long as the marriage ceremony that promise did and uh, they never were able to have the spiritual influence over that spouse so um, uh, <laughs> the best uh, scriptural advice that anyone can give is to marry a Christian and then there is Peter's uh, statement to wives who are married to non-Christians. It is not leave that husband that will not listen to the word of God, but rather live before that husband in such a way that though he can't be won immediately by the word, he can by your chaste life and your godly life be won to the Lord by causing him to soften his heart, obviously, and listen to the word so that he will obey the gospel. We have a situation in North Point where we have a uh, dear lady who is married to a non-Christian. And uh, we've asked her about uh, coming to the house and getting acquainted with him and perhaps trying to influence him for the truth. And she said, no, I think, Dub, it would uh, be counterproductive to do so. He is extremely prejudiced against all religion. And uh, he uh, would not welcome you. And uh, she said, I'm, I'm just trying to live the best Christian life before, her that, before him that I possibly can and perhaps uh, uh, cause him to want to listen to God's word. I said, you're doing exactly the right thing. Just keep it up. And uh, I, I believe that's what the scripture teaches concerning the Christian who's married to a non-Christian, it's not something that God prefers, but it is something that God allows, according to the New Testament. In relationship to that, um, I don't know how many of you know Brother George Darling. I never had that honor, but uh, he married a Christian, and he was not one. Uh, and probably Daniel could tell the story a whole lot better. He's probably heard it more than I have. But, uh, but, uh, and I'll ask him to tell it. So, uh, but before you do, there's a lot of Christians when they're married to non-Christian who then will ask, "Well, how can I convert him or her?" And 
Our answer probably should be you never will. Because you're not really faithful yourself. And until you decide to be faithful, you're never going to convert him. Your example is being the opposite of converting him. You are keeping him away. Now, that's not what they would want to hear, but that's in reality what takes place. Now, in the story about Brother Darling is a great illustration of that. And so... Daniel Dunham, uh, Parish, Florida. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Darling, uh, they were living in San Francisco at the time. And, uh, of course, Doris was a member of the Lord's Church, and they'd had their first child. And uh, George was a bit of a rounder. Uh, he was a longshoreman, uh, kind of a character. And he did his best to try to keep her from going to services. Uh, he would take, he'd put the car up on jacks, blocks, take a tire off, remove the distributor cap, any number of things to keep the car from being able to be used. And uh, he'd try to wait sometimes to make it harder for her to call someone to come pick them up. But uh, she'd still go. She'd just start walking wrap the baby up and head down the road and one day it uh, was just storming uh, outside and he had uh, I believe he had pulled the distributor cap on this occasion and uh, she bundled up the baby and started outside and had gone a little ways and he said I really felt like a heel said knowing what she was dealing with and this pouring rain and, the, and then the baby on top of that he said I threw open the window and yelled to her to come back I'd, I'd get the car ready and he said he ran out with the rain and with it pouring down on him he put the distributor back in and the cap back in and got it ready and drove him to services and uh, the uh, one thing led to another he was converted in a gospel meeting by Brother Rue Porter. And uh, he told uh, Doris, he said, if you'd ever stopped one time, I would never have obeyed the gospel. Uh, just two very quick things. One, you cannot prove, brethren, you know, from 1 Corinthians 7 or 1 Peter chapter 3, that the marriages under consideration were situations where uh, both parties were alien sinners at the time the marriages were formed. You cannot prove that from the text or the context. Uh, we've got some brethren, they, they assume their case when they say that the mixed marriage in 1 Corinthians 7 was a case where you had two unbelievers and one was uh, converted and so now you've got the question of, well, what does he do relative to the, un the unbeliever? What does the, cre the text doesn't presume any of that. It simply presents a case of an unbeliever and a Christian married to one another. What is the Christian to do? Well, if the unbeliever is willing to abide in the relationship, he or she is to remain with him. It does not presume any other, any other factors background. And the reason is... That makes it applicable to all situations for all time. Second, the, uh, and, uh, and we've stressed that over and over again. We've yet, uh, I've called upon these people to present one piece of evidence from the text itself that shows uh, that it's a case of an unbeliever who is married by a believer, actively married by a believer. They can't do that. The uh, second, on the, the unwise quibble, and that's really what it is, is a case of equivocation. Well, we're using the word unwise in the sense of a matter of, a of, a matter of judgment. Uh, it may be unwise, for instance, for the elders of the congregation here, simply on the basis of the finances, to set up a radio program. You know, maybe your finances are such that you can't afford it, can't operate is it a sin that you get a radio program started? No. But it might be unwise simply because you can't, you don't have the financial structure maybe to do it. Or like we, the congregation our size and parish. 
Look at Buddy. Look at Buddy. Okay. So, <laughs> so you may have a situation like that, and you say, well, is it unwise? Is it necessarily sinful? No. No. And that's how we're using the word. In Ephesians chapter 5, that is not how the word unwise is being used. Contextually, it's talking about uh, doing that which is contrary to God's will, contrary to the word, similar to the way in which the words wise and unwise, in fact, there are, there are uh, in uh, Matthew 7, you have uh, verse 21 following, you have some synonyms being used with that very idea. The one who hears and does the word of God is what? He's wise. The one who doesn't is a fool. He's unwise. And so there's a difference between something being unwise and sinful and being unwise just simply a, 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 a matter of judgment. Okay. When that first came up, I was thinking about how many of us uh, lectureship directors have been sinning over and over again in view of the unwise selections we make. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can understand that one too. Okay, one last question that uh, we were handed. Why ought a person refuse to go out to eat with a certain brother from California? What happened? What happened during the Pensacola Whataburger incident? And it says, "Ask Dub McClish to answer." Well, this is totally impromptu, of course. <laughs> My name's Dub McClish from Denton, Texas. And um, I'm not sure whether there's a Whataburger around here, but it doesn't, doesn't matter whether it's a Whataburger or not. Just you're very unwise if you go, <laughs> if you go out to eat with Brother Johnny Oxendine because... Especially don't wear a new suit because it just uh, invites whatever is in the cup of drink that he's ordered. And um, I still haven't had my cleaning bill paid for uh, what my suit absorbed uh, last June at the Whataburger in, in Pensacola. But, uh, I'm, I'm an unbiased, uh, I'm, put it on. I'm an unbiased witness to this event. I'm Terry Hightower from Amarillo, Texas. I'm an unbiased uh, witness to this event, but let me just say this and make it very clear to you. You should never dine with the San Mateo oxen dine <laughs> that is as clumsy as an ox, at least not without protective gear like this is what we all found out. And I, I plead with brethren, either if you go out with Johnny tonight or any night at a lectureship or any other time, I uh, plead with brethren either to wear old clothing or, you know, if eating out with Johnny, or to get this gear. Some restaurants around in San Mateo actually supply it now. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of ravioli and spaghetti places, and they've banned Johnny from even coming in the place. So there's... Thank everyone for the comments. And... <laughs> Uh, and we it's always enjoyable to have a little bit of fun especially from that fellow at the from the land of fruits and nuts <laughs> uh, remember this is an open forum so I don't know whether uh, Johnny likes it that open <laughs> but we do <laughs> We're happy that you've all been here, and I hope the questions have been, maybe except that last one, <laughs> have been helpful to you in understanding scriptures, causing us to think about them, and understanding even uh, some of the comments that were made, how to study. And um, Part of rightly dividing the word of truth when it comes to coming to the knowledge of what the scriptures say on certain things. Well, we'll be back tonight, the Lord willing, and remember at uh, 6.30... We will be having uh, singing. Uh, may I ask, John, do you know whether you or 
Well, that means then, Brother John, that uh, you be here ready to go in case Brother Jeff Barnett is not.